research I've been doing to put in the application for the club to become a historic, to be on the registry of historic landmarks for the U.S. So fingers crossed that that all works out. I do want to say that Frank Glenn has been so helpful to me as the architect for the architectural section of this application. He donated his services and two interns this summer to come and help with everything. So I'm about to submit again. We were accepted in the first round with some revisions, including a better job on the architecture than I had done, not being an architectural historian. And um, so now with Frank's help, that's ready and we'll submit again. So now, uh, what I've learned about our clubhouse, and it's interesting, as the years have gone by, different people have written histories of the club and often built on other histories with some not so accurate information. <laughs> so I have attempted to correct that information and what you're getting today is a true history of this amazing schoolhouse and our club. So, thank you. We can't talk about the clubhouse without talking about the history of El Segundo. So just very quickly, a little bit of a refresher because I'm sure many of you know about the history of this town. In 1911, Standard Oil, which was looking for a site for a second refinery in California, hired R.J. Hanna to find land in Southern California because there was a plant in uh, Richmond, California. Standard Oil, with Hanna's help, purchased 840 acres in June of 1911, and they opened the refinery by the end of that year, so very quickly. This is a picture of the first board meeting held for Standard Oil at El Segundo. It's from the Chevron History website. So there's Hannah, and he's holding his first board meeting on the beach at El Segundo. And when the surveyors came to start to survey the land for the refinery, the railroad conductors who let them off here said, what on earth are you doing? And they said, well, we're here to survey to build the refinery for Standard Oil. And they said, but there is nothing here. And they were right. And here it is in 1911. The land that El Segundo uh, Refinery is on was originally owned by the Tongva, the Native American Tongva. And it became Rancho Salsa Redondo in an 1837 Mexican land grant to the Avila family. So now you all know how the restaurant Salsa got its name. The, unfortunately, the Avila heirs were unable to pay the inheritance taxes. So the land was sold. It passed through a number of hands before Standard Oil arrived on the scene. And when they did, it was being used to farm melons and lima beans. And Standard Oil brought in something like 500 mules to level the land which likely was just the refinery land, because I think we all know that our houses are on those sand dunes. So they leveled the land for the refinery. And if you're going to have a refinery, you need to have workers. And obviously in those days they weren't commuting, so they needed a town. And the El Segundo Land and Improvement Company the founders and owners of the town site of El Segundo, which essentially was Standard Oil, purchased an additional 1,470 acres in July, one month after the Standard Oil purchase. And as you all, I'm sure, know, it's Hannah's wife, Virginia, who is credited with naming the town El Segundo, the Spanish for the second, being the second refinery that Standard Oil has in, had in California. 
And I think this, obviously the street of Virginia must be named for her as well. The October 19, 1911, El Segundo Herald had the headline, The Town That Must Be Built. And they went on to say, and built up quickly to provide for the army of well-paid and highly skilled workmen that will pour out daily from the $3 million refining plant of Standard Oil. And several civic buildings were built in that first year, including our schoolhouse. And I just want you to look at this map. I think it's so fascinating. Look how flat El Segundo is. <laughs> so this is a very fanciful map to get people to move here. And then this, I believe, is supposed to be the ocean, but I don't know how many of you have ever seen the ocean looking south from El Segundo. I certainly haven't. And this is Catalina, which again, should actually be over here. <laughs> but it was a great promotion piece, right? To get people to move here and take the jobs. So who were these early settlers, pioneers of El Segundo? that came to fill these jobs at the refinery. They came from California, the Midwest, Denver, and Nevada. And I know this because my sister, who is a historian, pulled the census records for the 1900s for me. And we went through the names of the early members of the club to learn about the people that were working at the refinery. These early settlers lived in tents. The floors were carpeted. They had drapes on the windows. They had cedar clothes closets. And they had couches that they made into beds. The first child born in El Segundo was born in 1912 to the postmaster in a tent, one of these tents, and they named her Segundo. <laughs> So pictured here are Victor and Stella McCarthy at their tent, very proudly in the Herald. Victor McCarthy was the city clerk for El Segundo from 1917 until his death in 1951. And his wife Stella was one of the 17 founding members of the El Segundo Women's Club and a past president. And their son, Victor Jr. So here is one of the first pictures of our schoolhouse, and it's right here on Richmond Street, that, right behind that big giant tree. And then this is Library Park, now, today, the library area, and another, I think this is a grocery store that was next to the school, so the kids could go over there and get candy after school. <coughs> And here it is again on the 19, am I pointing at the right one? Let me check my map here where I can actually read. No, this is the school right here. There's our school. It says school <laughs> on Richmond. And this is the 1917 Sanborn map for El Segundo. And for those of you who don't know, these were late 19th, early 20th century maps that were used for fire insurance companies to assess their um, liability for urban areas. And they're now at the Library of Congress, and they're used for things like our application. And here's our schoolhouse. This is looking east the north side here, Mariposa side now. And in 1948, an office was built right here, that office back there, and the door was changed at that time too. The roof, as you've noticed, was also changed sometime before the women bought it. But that was the original wood frame schoolhouse. And it opened with 62 students in grades one through eight. High school students were bused to Inglewood High School. And it was very likely built by local craftsmen. It wasn't built by a noted architect. 
And here you see now, this is the Maricosa side, and this entrance was redesigned in 1940 by John Austin, and we'll get to that in a minute. But I suspect that Segundo and Victor are probably in this group of children. And here they are in the room right there, which is virtually unchanged from the time that this picture was taken in the 19, 1910s. So there they are at their desks. And now I'll switch gears to the founding of the Women's Club, because we can't talk about our building without talking about the women who were smart enough to buy it. Uh, as you probably know from what's been written many times, Hallie Gregory brought together several women to form the Women's Civic Improvement Club of El Segundo, California on May 23, 1922. And the minutes say that it was for the purpose of searching for knowledge and to help their neighbors. Seventeen women signed on to be the original founders of the club, and pictured here is Helen Brock. She was voted in as the first president of the El Segundo Women's Club. So who were these women? Hallie Gregory was from Missouri. She had gone to a formal school. Her husband was a gardener, and she, had, she took in three boarders. She had a very large house. She also had a big yard and a fence. And in the minutes, they talk about Hallie opening her house for children to play, because they didn't have a lot of places to play in those days on the sand dunes. Helen Brock had not attended school, and most of the women into the late 1930s had not attended school, but they were homeschooled. And they were literate from reading the minutes. They were highly educated. They also knew about bylaws, articles of incorporation. So they were well-schooled, even though they didn't go to a formal school. Helen Brock's husband was a refiner at the refinery. Other of the officers at the early years were Effie Dix from Colorado. Her husband was a carpenter, may have worked on the schoolhouse. Florence Haynes' husband was a guard at the refinery. And as I mentioned, Stella McCarthy's husband was the city clerk. Interestingly, they didn't all live in El Segundo. Some of them lived in Inglewood and Torrance. It's recorded in the minutes that in their first year, they focused on a city park, sewage disposal, city management, hosting a reception for teachers, soldiers bonds, the Wright Act, which has to do with water for California, a shelter at the railroad stop, and affiliation with the Federation of Women's Clubs. They changed the name to the El Segundo Women's Club, October 17, 1923. And in those early years, so 1922, they didn't own a clubhouse. They met at City Hall. They met in the school auditorium. They met at the American Legion Club building and in private homes. They were a very feisty bunch. Reading through the minutes is hilarious. They had Stella McCarthy's husband come and meet with them several times to explain his role as city clerk and to discuss the management of the city of El Segundo. They wanted a permanent place on the school board, and they had been very instrumental in lobbying for the high school that was built in 1927. They, but the school board graciously said thank you, but no thanks. <laughs> they uh, attended the board of trustee meetings for the city of El Segundo and reported back to the membership on what was discussed and they never let up on the Hyperion issue. It must have been dreadful in those days. They enlisted the help of every city council in the South Bay, and they never stopped writing letters to the county and bringing it up at City Hall. So they were, they were really a fascinating group of women. The board
board began discussing the possibility of owning their own clubhouse in the late 1920s, and they formed a building club in 1930. In November of 1931, they voted to purchase two lots on the corner of Mariposa and Standard Street. So they would have bought the two right here in 1931. And in 1936, in February, they purchased the remaining adjoining two lots for $300. So I, I can imagine they paid virtually nothing for the other two. And at that time, you can see the United Methodist Church was built in 1928. So that was here. The high school was across the street in 1927. And then all of the rest of the neighborhood was zoned for residential. At the end of the school year, 1933, the town discontinued classes in the 1912 schoolhouse. It was left empty, looks quite empty here, doesn't it, and used for storage. In 1935, it was used for recreation purposes. I can't imagine quite what that was, but it was. And in February 27th of 1936, it was moved to the grounds of the high school. So you can see the high school right in back of it, and here it is, on its timbers from having been moved from Richmond over to the high school. And it was used at the high school to house students while the high school was repaired. It had sustained some damage in the 1933 Long Beach earthquake. So they put the students there. But at the December 26, 1933 meeting of the El Segundo Grammar School Board, the superintendent reported that he inquired with the county about disposing of the old frame building, and he was told, quote, there seems to be no method by which a district can give away any school property, however valueless it may be. The funds received may be only a nominal sum, say a dollar, which money must be turned into the building fund of the district. On November 23, 1936, the El Segundo Unified School District filed a notice of intention that the frame building was no longer needed for public use and they intended to quote, sell it for a minimum price of one dollar more or less with certain terms. And one of those terms was that it be moved off of the grounds of the high school by the end of 1936. And here we have the hero of the clubhouse. Mrs. Hunt. She was from California. Her husband was a machinist at the refinery, and she had been head of the building committee for a few years looking for a building. She introduced the possibility of purchasing the schoolhouse at the November 18, 1936 board meeting. The board approved a motion to bid on the frame building. They were the successful bidders, and I suspect they were the only ones. <laughs> they actually paid $63.35 to the school board for the building. They didn't move it by the end of 1936. They weren't ready. And they, the president wrote a letter to the superintendent asking for an extension to February 23, 1937. And that was four days before the timbers at Sidion were due to expire from their lease. So they transported, um, they had to transport the building across the street. And to do that and make minor repairs, the club took out an eight and a half year loan from Bank of America. 29 club members pledged to pay the $25 monthly fee until the club was able to pay for the building. Oh, I just want to say, 
I guess John Austin must have made this model for her. So they had a model of the clubhouse at one time. And here is John C. Austin. And how he came to be involved, unfortunately, we will never know. There is nothing in the minutes about him whatsoever. There's a tiny bit in the school board minutes, but nothing in our minutes. He was born in England in 1870, emigrated to San Francisco, then moved to Los Angeles, died in 1963. He was one of the most prominent architects in Los Angeles, working in the 30s and 40s as a Beaux-Arts style architect. He's responsible for some of the most iconic buildings in the city, the City Hall, Griffith Observatory, the LA Times Building, Shrine Auditorium, and together with his partner, Frederick Ashley, he donated his services pro bono to helping the women to determine how much it would cost to repair the building for use. And then, in 1940, again, pro bono, he designed the entrance that we now have on Mariposa. So this is John Austin's design. It's actually neoclassical, not Beaux Arts, but it is still very important because there is not a lot of residential architect the architecture that's left by him. In a letter to Mrs. Hunt on December 29th, 1936, he estimated that of the $2,000 loan, they would need 450 to move the building, 400 to lay a foundation, 400 for plumbing and a sewer line, and the balance for new partitions, including an auditorium in the small wing, and general repairs. And he, the letters between the two of them, because he lived in Pasadena, so he only came here a couple of times during the renovation, but he and Mrs. Hunt exchanged letters almost daily, and they're wonderful to read. In one letter he told her, quote, far too many good, sturdy old buildings were thrown away when with a little careful study they could be made to serve for many years. He's obviously right. A landscape architect, an interior decoration specialist, and a local contractor also donated their services. So with free labor, the club women were able to pour the foundation, do the electrical work, plastering, and plumbing. The Herald reported that there were 135 days of free man labor, 20 days of free boy labor, 30 days of labor for men whose wives did not belong to the club, and 50 days of women labor. And here they are working away, in the, pictured in the LA Times. The first official meeting was held on May 27, 1937, and it's considered official because the juniors actually met in here before the membership. And of the, so the May 27th meeting was the last meeting of the year. It included the installation of new officers, a contributed dish dinner, which sounds so much more elegant than potluck. <laughs> and it began at 6.30 p.m. and had a home movie showing the step-by-step -step renovation of the clubhouse, which as Carol said when I told her that, why don't we have it? Wouldn't it be wonderful? And the club held a variety of fundraisers to raise money to pay off the loan, including an early event for 350 people that earned them $35 toward the building fund. After that, they held fundraisers in what's um, now Library Park. They did rummage sales, fiestas, town fairs, card parties, bake sales, square dances, sales of a cookbook, and rentals of the clubhouse. We haven't come very far, have we? <laughs> to pay off the debt, which they did the mortgage in 1943. 
And here is Mrs. Tilton, who was president of the club during those years, burning the mortgage so that we could now own this amazing historic building. Thank you.